Nice. Um, who is a Drupal service provider of some kind? Excellent. So does everybody more or less do projects for clients, for other companies? Yes. Is there anybody who works inside an organization but does the Drupal inside there? Okay. So, and how many of you are accidental business people? I mean, you learned to code, you found Drupal, you did some stuff, and you found yourself running a business. You found yourself selling um, instead of just writing code, and then you have to, um, you know, you have to, ex you, you love what you do. We have this beautiful system, and we can make all these incredible experiences, right? But then you have to sort of explain that to someone else, and you get that blank stare across the table, and they, no, they don't, you figure they don't get why you're really enthusiastic about dependency injection or what have you, right? So, as geeks, right, and I'm in this, uh, the same situation where I accidentally fell into, uh, into selling Drupal in, <clears throat> in some interesting ways, we get excited about the wrong stuff to sell our wares. Um, we get really excited about uh, semantically correct markup and reducing divs in the theme layer and dependency injection and object-oriented code and how interfaces mean that we don't have to use, you know, the naming convention magic of hooks anymore. That's all fantastic. Nobody else cares but us. And so what I want to talk about today is um, we have this incredible new uh, system called Drupal 8 that we can use to, um, you know, not only pay our own rent and, and uh, you know, build beautiful things, but we can help other people realize their vision, get their business done, and so on. And I want to talk about how we tell those stories, and I'm hoping that it'll help you, you know, win some more deals, make Drupal bigger, better um, for all of us. Uh, everybody pretty much calls me Jam, except my mother. I am the Evangelist Developer Relations at Acquia, which is, uh, I like the title, and it's a, it's a, I like the job, too. Um, very active at the Acquia podcast. Is this working? Ha ha! We, we now have this thing called the, uh, I think we call it the developer portal, dev.acquia.com if you go there. Um, I write the Drupal 8 module of the week series. Since, I've been doing that since January. That's been really fun. Um, two things there. Go read it because it's um, uh, similar to some of the ideas that I'm talking about today. Um, and also, if you have a module that you've upgraded to Drupal 8 and you think people should know about it, I'm looking for my next series of these blog posts. So Drupal 8 modules that you love or that are yours, come pitch them to me. I would love to talk about that. Um, yeah, I'm pretty easy to find on the web. Horn Cologne at Twitter, jamadaku.com. And uh, yeah, I'd love to talk with you anytime. So we're all here because Drupal 7 was a huge success. Okay, something like 2% of the web is on Drupal, something like 5% of websites where we can identify a CMS, that's Drupal. Uh, we have more than 35,000 active developer accounts on Drupal.org, more than, uh, certainly more than, it depends on how you slice it and dice it, but say 80, 100,000 um, active accounts on Drupal.org. The, the membership number is kind of fun, but I, I really don't think that there are a million people coming to Drupal.org. So, so Drupal's, uh, Drupal's done really well, and, and right away, selling Drupal, okay, there are, there are a couple of salient facts here. Um, one of them's not even on the slide, but Drupal's been around for 15 years, and in minute zero, when you download Drupal and you start to work for someone else, you can tell them that they haven't just hired you, they've hired 30,000 other people who are taking care of this stuff, and a group of people who've been building on their success on the web for 15 years, okay? So millions of hours of coding and, and an incredible amount of experience have gone into this. Um, So I like that. And you can say, hey, this, this was DrupalCon Austin, um, the group photo, that's me. Uh, that is what 10% of our developer community looks like, right? That's about 3,500 people there in Austin. That's what 10% of our developer community looks like. That's what you're hiring. Um, and if you want to find out more about what Drupal 7 has done, uh, the case studies on Drupal.com and Drupal.org uh, tell a tiny piece of that story, and it's a, it's a useful resource. Now who was incredibly happy when Drupal 8 came out last November. You're not putting your hand up. 
<laughs> um, and who was unbelievably relieved that it was finally out? Oh, so, um, so this is a system that you know Dries was probably thinking about eight or ten years ago, and 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 put into you know put the pieces into place seven years ago, and cut the first uh, code for um, six six years ago. Um, and we finally got it out in, no, in, in November, and he had all these ideas, and of course, all of the core community and the people who touched this stuff, not just Dries, but he's a metaphor for us in this moment. He thought about all this stuff and, and put it in motion five years ago. So there's a huge risk, people might ask you this, there's a huge risk that you're building their stuff with the technology from five years ago. Five years ago, uh, Five years ago, my pocket supercomputer was not as powerful. Five years ago, people were still accessing the web the majority of the time on full-size monitors. Five years ago, Drupal 7 and every other system essentially was assuming that you were um, making a request, getting a response to build an HTML um, web page on a giant screen in a browser. And you know, our reality today is not like that. So. Um, are we getting yesterday's technology or is this something that, that people should really invest in now? And um, I am certain that actually Drupal 8 is the right technology at the right time. It gives us an incredible amount of capabilities to, to really not only do a great job with today's technology, but it's been constructed in a way that it's gonna allow us to keep ourselves relevant, to keep innovating much, much faster and much more predictably within the project and deliver great experiences for the next however long Drupal 8 is our main release and, and probably beyond there as well. Copy down this link, but uh, the ultimate guide to Drupal 8 has just been rewritten. Angie, Byron and I spent about the last month redoing this book. Next week, I'm going to put up online the ultimate guide to Drupal 8 revised and updated for Drupal 8.1. We just finished it last week. I've got a blog post ready to go, but we're not releasing it during the chaos of DrupalCon, and um, it's, been a, it's been a helpful resource. It's a, it's a broad overview of a lot of the features um, from a, a pretty good compromise position between technical and um, non-technical people. It's a, it's a good read. I think it's a valuable resource. You can you know, print it out, do whatever you want with it. Um, so I'm gonna go through a list now of 10 feature areas and some of them interlock and some of them are relatively simple and some of them are relatively complex. Ten feature areas that are new things in Drupal 8. And all of this builds on Drupal 7, all of this builds on the success that we had and things that Drupal 7 already did, things that made us, helped us be this successful, I'm not really gonna talk about those. Um, so let's just assume for argument's sake that everything we could do in Drupal 7, we can do in Drupal 8. And I'm gonna talk about the new parts and I'm gonna talk about them in terms of uh, business value and, and uh, how, how certain problems are solved and what we have from that. And I just want to mention um, on the side as well, I'm doing a, uh, I want to turn this into a series of blog posts. I've done this presentation a couple of times and um, thankfully so far there's been a really positive response. I hope you're not the exception today. Um, and the, 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 the mental model that I have in the back of my head, I'd like to put it in your mind as well, because I don't say this explicitly when I'm talking about this now necessarily, but um, there are a number of, of different audiences that we can and are generating business value for. So, you know, for developers and for managers and for Drupal service providing companies, there's a lot of value as well as for site owners and customers and clients and so on. So I'm really hoping to turn this talk into a series of posts that, uh, that say things in terms of like, well, this feature, you know, can, um, <clears throat> you know, help you save this, help you achieve that, help you optimize that, um, you know. So, so that's my goal here is um, I want to help, I want, I want to talk through the technical stuff in a way that non-technical people m might be interested in and I'm really, really hoping it'll help you sell this cool new toy that we have. So a huge, a huge big deal for um, us in Europe and, and other places in the world where there are uh, countries with multiple official languages. Uh, Belgium has, uh, Switzerland has four or five depending on how you count it. Belgium has three, uh, India has 22. There are a lot of places in the world where you need to be able to build multilingual sites and 
we did very, very well with multilingual in Drupal 7, but you needed 30 modules all written in different ways at different times that were hard to get to play nice with each other to get close to having a fully translatable system and, and, and a nice localized, internationalized site. In Drupal core, um, instead of this really complex system in Drupal 7 where content translation and entity translation are not the same thing, even though they're content, and then variables, and then localization and everything was spread out uh, uh, you know, all over the place. In Drupal 8, we've got this beautiful situation where there are four core modules that break out the translation and internalization stuff, excuse me. You could turn them on and it will let you model any given uh, language model that you need, including having um, multiple different administrator languages in the back end. Um, and it's broken into four areas because there are so many different ways that, that translation and localization can happen, that there are sites where the front end will have a number of languages, but the back end only one, or the front end only has one and the back end has a bunch, or you have a regional portal where the website is the same, but the content is different in different languages, and so on and so forth. So um, being able to translate the language of all of the content in a sensible way and translate all of the, uh, sorry, I've got that. You know I can usually see. all that stuff can also be translatable. So um, no stone has been left unturned. Anything that is language um, is then also translatable. That's a huge value um, for people like Amazie Labs. They live in Switzerland. Every site they do has two to four languages in it. So we're going to be able to deliver multilingual sites more reliably with much, much less configuration time. Um, that'll help us make more money and deliver better projects for people. So, you know, mobile first is a big, big selling point now. And, and five years ago, this was surprising and interesting that, that this was such a big deal. But now, of course, we do, uh, you know, mostly use the internet via our telephones. Um, and so Drupal 7 wasn't responsive out of the box. Drupal, had, Drupal 7 had no uh, assumption of doing much of anything except delivering HTML to a regular browser on a big screen. Um, and you... It, it, you know, we worked with Drupal 7 for five or six years, and of course we ended up being able to turn out mobile apps that were powered by it and so on, but the system was never designed to do that stuff. So this mobile first initiative uh, for Drupal 8, one of the things is that, uh, well, our, our default output is HTML5, and um, that comes with a lot of mobile optimization built in. We can throw videos in there without doing anything special at all. Um, we get offline caching for free which HTML5. And this is an interesting, this is an interesting sub-theme uh, around Drupal 8. A lot of the decisions and choices that have been made give us a bunch of benefits for free just because we adopt a technology like HTML5, just because we adopt a technology like Twig and Symfony, which I'm gonna get to, we get all sorts of stuff for free which makes our lives easier and better and then also lets us deliver better projects uh, for our clients. So offline caching, there's some really interesting stuff going on with that. Um, there's some, Dick Olson has been working on some stuff where you make Drupal uh, uh, sort of app style applications that emulate Couchbase in the back end. It's really, it's super interesting. I think there's a lot more to explore in there. Um, browser cross compatibility uh, is pretty much built into HTML5, thank goodness. Um, and overall we get a lot of uh, cleaner code. So it's great for developers, it's great for delivering multimedia, it's great for a, a bunch of reasons and we just get that out of the box. Um, all of Drupal 8's base themes, um, the admin area and so on, are responsive out of the box. That means if we're on a tablet or a screen or a big screen or a telephone or whatever we want, um, it will be presented differently, optimized for whatever it is that we're looking at. And of course, um, you know, you can customize all that, but it is uh, responsive right out of the box. Who had the enormous pleasure in their career of editing content or changing a setting in a view in Drupal setting on a smartphone. Because that was awesome. So it looked like this. Oh, 
Oh, shh, ah, shh, ah. <laughs> it was very, very painful. Our back end in Drupal 8 is responsive out of the box, and um, I've already worked on Drupal 8 sites like Drupal.com um, and made changes on the fly on my phone, and it was, I'm, partly I just did it because I had to prove it to myself that it was work, but it's really, really nice, and there's some really, really nice uh, sort of, there's nice candy in the way that we've implemented responsive first. So admin works out of the box, and it's got some nice tricks like um, the words in the menu turn into icons in, in this view. Um, things can move around. There's a, there's a great contributed module called responsive and off canvas menu that switches you from an on-screen menu on a big browser to, to a, a hidden menu that comes out when you hit the hamburger button on a mobile device. Very, very nice implementation. Um, there's, so there's lots of, this is enabling us to innovate in all sorts of ways. Um, I want to mention responsive tables here. So the admin interfaces, um, when, they, when they include tables, and you can do this in your own stuff, uh, you can have a table displaying stuff and you can declare priorities of the columns so as your viewport gets smaller, the columns will drop off in the order that you tell them to and you can only keep the important on, uh, ones on there. It's nice and it's a, it's a nice bit of usability. I don't think I'm going to talk about this as much as I want to, but um, you could argue that the way Drupal 8 has been built is also restful first. Um, I have fr a lot of friends in the core developer team and um, some of them hate that I use these words, but I'm in marketing, so um, I'm hoping we can get a compromise. But um, so Drupal has a, a, a traditionally been a really, really good at integration. So it's really good at ingesting web services, taking data from wh wherever it's supplied, mm, turning it into content and managing that content, you know, views and all that stuff, and then outputting it again. And we have also, you know, for a long time, been able to make Drupal a, a, a web service, an API provider. Okay, but now, um, with Drupal 8 being restfully architected internally and externally, and with a couple of amazingly cool tricks, um, we turn on RESTful web services, turn on a couple modules in core, and well, I've got this on a later slide, but I'm going to give the game away now. One of, I think possibly for me the coolest thing in Drupal 8 is that um, it is a user interface for building API-based businesses, you know. There are a lot of businesses, a lot of stuff that's happening in the digital sphere, and I'm trying not to say on the web or on the internet now, where you are managing data wherever you're collecting it or generating it and outputting it to create value. The, the MTA, the New York City uh, Public Transit Authority, they have an open data portal that's powered by Drupal, but that data you know, powers 50 or 100 apps that consume it and deal with it. And they, so there's this idea that we turn government data, for example, that's just floating around, we turn that into actual money, like people can make money and feed their families, by extracting economic value out of data. So Drupal 8, we can build with this UI without, be, without being coders, okay, which is another huge thing in Drupal that we've decided to take the power of this code and put it in the hands of people using the interface. So we can design a system that ingests data, models it, plays with it, does whatever we want, and then outputs it again. There doesn't even have to be a website behind it. Um, and we're building APIs with it. We're building you know, it's just the building blocks of having a digital business. So the coolest thing in Drupal 8 of all, who, who doesn't know, who doesn't know about views? Very good. So every, every view in Drupal 8, you can check one checkbox, and that view is a REST endpoint. So literally, whatever view you can build, that can be, that's a web service. So, this is really powerful. I'm really, really excited about it. And the fact that we have this RESTful, um, this RESTful capabilities that are very solid in Drupal 8 means, makes integrations much faster and easier, allows us, this is a slide from my friends at Pantheon, um, of different, you know, semi-coupled, decoupled uh, uh, app style, CMS models, whatever. We can model all of this stuff now in Drupal 8. I have been hanging around in the PHP and Symphony worlds a lot in the last few years. This is from a talk that Campbell Vertesi and I gave at Symphony Live in Berlin, where this is a, you know, a fictitious app design. Man, I wish I could take the mic with me. Hello? Okay, 
I, oh, there we go. Well, that works. Hey, so this is fun. Um, so we designed this fictitious microservices style app where um, you can see that we have Drupal acting as a CMS, uh, storing and managing content. And um, it's not even handling user authentications necessarily. You know, we've integrated an LDAP directory there. We've got a CRM coming in. Uh, we have a custom Symfony app that's going through the Symfony Drupal 8 wrapper, which already exists. It's there for you. So you write your specialist app, however you want to write it. We've got it in, uh, you know, we've got our native apps, of course, for iPhones. And then we've got something really super trendy for the cool kids. Um, so we have like a, a hipster Ember um, app. It's still powered by this thing. This is all happening at the same time. It still powers a regular old website, OK, which is made beautiful by Twig. Um, and our content admins, they have a single interface that they have to deal with. You update something here, it's a canonical data source. It gets fixed everywhere else. I don't have to have an M dot version. I don't have to have a separate app. Drupal 8 powers all of this through uh, RESTful web services. So I can build one thing in one place, and it handles all my needs. And this is really, really powerful. Us, and I'm pitching to the PHP people. I'm saying, stop writing single-use micro CMSs. That's crazy. Don't do that work, right? We've got a loosely coupled, really, really powerful CMS written in a standards-compliant, modern way in PHP. Just use us. We're cool. And come hang out with us, because we're fun. Robert Douglas did this slide in Stockholm. Um, I could also stop at this point and say that the Drupal itself, of course, is the result of efforts of a lot of people. And this presentation, um, I've taken pieces from Gabor Hoichi and Robert Douglas and a lot of other people that I've, uh, and I've seen along the way. And I'm trying to collect this information and, and give it to you in a, you know, in a compact package. So Robert Douglas's slide for this was better accessibility for 285 people. <laughs> <laughs> which was awesome. So there are 285 visually impaired people in the world, um, which is not quite true. Drupal 7 was great for accessibility. And if anybody remembers at DrupalCon Portland, um, Vincenzo Rubano came. And uh, he's a young Italian guy who's visually impaired. And he found our project and, and fell in love with the accessibility and used it to build an amazing thing uh, in Italy. It's called, uh, in Italian, it's Ti Tengo Docchio, which means I have my eye on you. So he tests websites and software and then reviews them for accessibility and writes a blacklist and reports about the accessibility problems on his website. And he reaches out to anyone who wants to to help them improve their applications. So the point of that story is that you know, he could only do this with open source because this is a case where proprietary would never like, give him a free site to build. It's another, another story I tell. But he fell in love with Drupal's accessibility back in the day. And Drupal 8 has why ARIA markup throughout it so that um, screen readers know what they're looking at, know how to talk about it, um, and all these other things. Now, the interesting thing, if you do government work, if you do university work, if you do public sector work of any kind, this is really a really important sales point for you that the government of Canada, the United States, Australia, and many others, they use Drupal. We have packages ready, the, the AGOV and GovCMS in Australia, the, um, um, I guess, whatever the successor to now public is. I don't know if now public is still current in the US. But accessibility and security and so on, it's, it's all well proven in Drupal. So those of us who work in the public sector, it's a, it's a really big advantage. Um, if you're not dealing with the public sector, this stuff is still interesting for at least one reason. And Vincenzo put it best. He told me, he said, accessibility is simply usability. You know, well-structured data easy to understand page layouts. Like, that helps us. And we're going to come back to this a few times. Because our page output is well structured, uh, it turns out that the search engines really love us. So just by throwing on Drupal, uh, we're going to get a better, you know, better results in, in, uh, in the search engines. If you're going to build an, a web application of any consequence, you're going to want to know out of the gate that it can scale and that it'll remain fast. You know, you're hoping for traffic, and if success hits you, you, you want to be ready for that. And um, Drupal 8 has a lot to offer on this front. If you look at the raw PHP benchmarking of Drupal 8, it's, um, um, depending on how you set it up, it, it 
looks like it runs slower than Drupal 7, but um, I'm not really worried about that. For, first of all, the raw benchmarks are also improving over time, but um, Drupal 8 is great for scalability. We have um, more precise caching. The best page caching in Drupal essentially cached the whole page, and when the cache is invalidated, it threw out the entire page cache and started rebuilding it. So Drupal, um, you know, that's a lot of work that takes a lot of time. Uh, Drupal 8, out of the box, uh, everything that's displayed has a cache tag, so we have granular caching, and if, you know, if my friend list or the weather report or my shopping cart, if my cache gets invalidated there, only the shopping cart cache is getting rebuilt when that, when that time comes, and not the rest of it. So I can still get cached stuff back really, really fast in Drupal 8, even though that, you know, I don't have to rebuild the whole page. I just rebuild what I need to build. Now, uh, cache invalidation is really, really hard to solve in computer science. It's one of the, you know, the classic problems. So, so this is a really big deal. I'm going to show you a couple of consequences of this cache tagging, and um, we really all should buy Fabian X and Wim Lears a drink of their choice to say thank you, because this is amazing. Um, with HTML5, uh, we get to offload a bunch of caching in certain situations, which is nice. And because we are completely or nearly completely compatible with PHP 7, just because we're keeping up with our friends in PHP land, we also get a huge performance benefit. This is the difference in performance between, um, and I can't read these from here, but uh, this is PHP 7, right? Is that PHP 7? Yeah. So even through the 5 series, we can see that, um, you know, the, the PHP that we use for Drupal 3.4 and then the, the PHP that, we, you know, that we've gone through in the last few years, we've gotten a lot of performance benefit just by being compatible with an up-to-date version of PHP. Um, PHP 7 gives us another huge leap. Um, I've, we are usually, I don't know the state this week, but we're usually completely um, uh, compatible with Hip Hop Virtual Machine as well, um, if anybody's running that. So just by keeping up with PHP, just by writing our thing in PHP and keeping up with what PHP is doing, we get a, we get a performance boost, which is, which is amazing. So uh, you need to tell people that, yes, we can scale. Yes, we're fast. Tell them that weather.com runs on... Um, on Drupal, tell them that the Winter Olympics that NBC runs, well, that's on Drupal as well. Tell them that the Grammys and the Brit Awards, you know, with those massive traffic spikes every year, those also run on Drupal. You know, you're good. So, cache tagging allows us to do this incredibly cool thing. Uh, who's heard of Big Pipe? Right, so Big Pipe is fun. Um, essentially, what this is showing here is um, any given page that we have uh, is made up of static elements that don't change very often and dynamic elements that can change at any time. And in Drupal 7, previously, um, we would make a request to load this page and Drupal would go build the entire page and then serve us that page. And however long it took to get the last thing would be the time it took to get the whole page. Now, uh, with BigPipe, because Drupal's caching system knows exactly the state of any you know, sub-object in cache. Um, it knows that, the, that this image here and the, and the text, which is what my site visitor is actually coming to see, it knows that that is already ready in cache and it delivers it instantly. It then goes and renders all the other stuff. So in this case, uh, it, checks my, it checks my user role and my permissions. Am I allowed to make content, uh, comments? Yes, give me the content thing. You know, what's, what, what are my friends doing? What's the music I'm listening to? So I get the static stuff instantly with big pipe, effectively, after a quarter of a second. Um, and everything else comes over time. The overall page load is exactly the same amount of time, but my user is seeing exactly what my user wants to see and read immediately, and it feels really, really wonderful. It feels much better. Um, so this is one wonderful consequence of this granular caching that we've got in Drupal 8. The next level of this, go check it out in Contrib, Refresh less, so, oh, and by the way, Big Pipe is in Drupal 8.1 core as an experimental module. You download Drupal 8.1, you turn it on, Drupal is delivering your site automatically in with, with Big Pipe. So, so um, and uh, the experimental modules in core, uh, I know that Big Pipe works really, really, really well, and the idea of the experimental phase in core is we need to test this at scale, find out what problems are, you know, edge cases, and solve for that so that we can move it into a full core status. 
module. Um, the, 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 the subsequent project is called Refreshless, and it's, um, I thought Big Pipe was cool when I heard about it. Refreshless takes this to the next level. If you're on your Drupal site looking at a page, um, and you click a link that's on the same Drupal site, Drupal 8 site, obviously, your site knows which elements on the page that you're looking at are also on the page that you want to go to, and it doesn't reload them at all. It just leaves them there and only, re only reloads the pieces of the page that are new, saving even more time, saving even more requests, saving electricity. I mean, if we want to think about this in a green way, one of the things that Wim Leers, who, one of the two developers who built this, uh, talks about, you know, if we want to make the world a better place, you know, we need to make our CMSs more efficient, right? So if we're making less requests, that's less electricity used by the servers. It's a, so Refreshless is kind of the next amazing level in that. Oh. So there's another theme that I've touched upon, but we're borrowing technology. This is open source, right? So we're open sourcing our open source project. Uh, quite a few years ago, we got burned by a bad... Uh, by a bad security bug in another project, and we decided that we were going to write everything ourselves. We were taking our ball, and we were going home because nobody else knows how to write code except us. Um, and we ended up with Drupal 7, which is a wonderful idiot idiomatic <laughs> mess of procedural code and some object orientation and some however Earl Miles felt on the day. And, you know, it's great, but it was the result of years and years and years of evolution. And um, it was kind of the ultimate expression of, of, of this procedural code um, paradigm. So we decided to update the way we write code, and we've decided to outsource a lot of risk and a lot of problems that we have. Um, and uh, so we had the not invented here syndrome, and we've moved to the proudly invented elsewhere paradigm. Um, and this is all thanks to, I'm only saying this because I wanted an excuse to use this slide. Um, this is thanks to a few things that have happened uh, along the way, but the uh, PHP Framework Interoperability Group has been defining standards that let us use, uh, share code across projects in really, really exciting uh, ways. This is not the um, talk to go, go into any detail, but essentially, since PHP 5.3, we've been able to share variables uh, that have the same name, thanks to namespacing. That allowed, allowed us to build dependency management in PHP via Composer, and it's allowed us to do things like put these nine uh, Symphony components in Drupal 8 core. It's allowed us to take the HTTP kernel and foundation and guzzle and throw out our old uh, Drupal idiomatic uh, HTTP request handler, which was, um, I forget how many lines of code. I think it was, was it 400? lines of recursively executing code, um, which meant that it was, I think it was untestable in the last, until the heat test of the universe or something. I mean, it is the, the cyclomatic complexity of this function was horrifying and we needed to get rid of it. So thankfully, our friends over in open source land invented all these nice things for us that we can use and we can focus on being good at what we're good at, which is content management, which is building web uh, service-based uh, API-based businesses and all that fun stuff. We get a huge benefit out of using all this open source code, not only because we get a better community, a bigger, better community, we get better security uh, management because we have to do less work. Um, it also means that we can finally hire people who know PHP and we can just sit them down with Drupal and they're going to be able to cope without like trying to figure out how hooks work um, and hook menu alter and hook form alter and some of the crazy hairy ones that, that, that don't work in IDs and they're, you know, kind of sort of undocumented. Um, we can get, bring people in. There was somebody at the code sprint in DrupalCon Barcelona who asked a question and ended up talking with a friend of mine. Uh, they're a PHP developer. They just came to DrupalCon in Barcelona to see what was going on. They went to the code sprint. They opened up Drupal for the first time ever in the code sprint um, and were able to contribute a patch to Drupal 8 the same day, right? So this is a great sign that we can hire people, uh, get more people interested in and using Drupal, whether it's in their own applications or working for us, um, but there are definitely proof points of this out in the wild already that we are now 
more accessible to other developers, and that's really, really good news for us in the long term. Twig itself, Twig is the theming, default theming layer in Drupal 8, and uh, it is built and maintained by the same people who build and maintain the Symfony 2 framework and the Symfony 3 framework now, uh, the Sensio Labs, and Twig is the front end for, uh, by my count, at least 100 other projects, so this is an incredibly well-known technology, and uh, designers and themers from across the PHP space will be able to work for us easily. Um, it is also secure, unless you're stupid enough to turn off the safety flag for this, it cannot touch the database, right? Don't do this. Um, as long as you don't do that, it, it can't touch the database, which means your theme layer can't create the white screen of death. So you can give your themer access to your server to work on these files with a lot less fear because they can't execute that kind of logic. Um, they do execute theme logic. You can put loops in MITs. It's really, really great. Um, and Twig also works it with, with grown-up developer tools. Um, if anybody cares to see um, how nice the syntax is, here are a few examples of this. It's essentially human-readable, um, much, much simpler than, than our uh, old PHP templating system. Mm. PHP template. Oh, yes, the good old days. Um, so, we can now very easily build great experiences for the people who live in the back end of our websites, whose day-to-day -day jobs is working within the things that we build and, you know, throw over the wall to them. Um, <clears throat> for the first time, we have WYSIWYG in core, and we have inline editing. Now, the interesting thing is there's been this transformation where um, Drupal generally has a pattern of abstracting and abstracting and further abstracting how we do things to make more and more sort of meta solutions so that you can do absolutely anything you want. And we always used to say, well, you know, you take it out of the box, and of course it doesn't do anything right now, but once we throw a few modules in there, it's gonna be awesome. We can, I promise we can do anything. So it's sort of like giving someone a giant tub of Legos instead of giving them the set that makes the spaceship with the picture on it, right? Um, one of the big changes in Drupal 8 is it's a lot more like a product now. You turn it on and you can build quite powerful websites. It's got all the translation stuff in it. It's got um, uh, a WYSIWYG editor in it for the first time. The CK editor, and we worked with the people who maintain CK editor. It's very, very, very tightly integrated with Drupal um, and very highly customizable within Drupal. The, for example, the, the image handling is Drupal native image handling. It respects uh, roles and permissions. And uh, one of the new things in Drupal 8.1, it now includes a language and a spell checking button built in. So CK Editor is really, really awesome, but we still have the API module in place in core so that if you don't like CK Editor, you can put in whatever you want, tiny MCE or, um, you know, any, any other crazy choice. Um, who likes tiny MCE? I remember, I think Tiny MCE was, was the, the code was, was bigger than Drupal 5 core when you installed it. That was exciting. Um, and we have this thing, inline editing, which is really, really neat. So um, we haven't touched on it yet, but uh, the data structures inside of Drupal 8 are very, very consistent because we had a new starter to everything's entities and fields. All the CRUD operations across the internal systems are the same. So that's allowed us to um, build inline editing into Drupal 8 where if I see a, a mistake or I want to add something or change something, it doesn't matter if it's a view rendered in a block, it doesn't matter if it's in the content page, it doesn't matter where I am, I can click into that, make the change, and it gets saved uh, and, and, and the change is updated everywhere it needs to be. And that wasn't possible before and that's a really, really handy feature for people, for site editors, for people who, who live and work on our sites. So there's a ton of value in this. Um, Everybody here um, admitted that they know what Views is, and it's this wonderful tool that allows us to make selections from our data based on whatever criteria we want, and then output that selection in uh, an amazing number of different ways, con lists and RSS feeds and slideshows and banners, and so on and so forth. And the really, really exciting thing for me, the, the most exciting thing I told you is every view can be a REST endpoint. That's fantastic. Um, the second most fantastic thing about having views in core is that it allowed us to throw out a lot of boilerplate code that used to run the admin backend 
uh, through Drupal 7. Now, a uh, great number of the admin pages in the back end of Drupal 8 are themselves views. So if you are a Drupal site builder and you know how to run the views UI, you can actually build a completely customized Drupal backend. Now you can design it to meet the needs of your users, um, put in, take out language information, avatar photos, put in, make them sortable, make them, whatever you can do with a view display, you can now do that in Drupal 8 backend and that's huge and I, I'm really looking forward to seeing and I haven't seen them yet but for example simplified workflow oriented backends that meet the needs of particular kinds of content authors or moderators and so on. I think there's a ton of potential to do that. It's very, very, very exciting to me. Um, only one slide about this but configuration management is kind of a big deal because it means that we kind of are like grown up software now. We can, um, <clears throat> essentially we took configuration data out of the database almost entirely. Um, so the database is now essentially content and we move configuration into text files which are called YAML files. It's another widely adopted uh, standard on the web. These YAML files are just text which means that we can uh, import them, export them and most importantly version control them. So I can have, um, whether I'm using Git flow or whatever else, I can have any number of devs working on any number of copies of my site um, and they then have the ability to um, throw the configuration along with the other code into the various sites and move through various stages of testing and so forth. This is really, really important um, and it solves a lot of the problems that we've had in the past with getting things between staging and production, and development and production. Um, there's a large debate going on which is very interesting to follow about what is configuration management good for, why do we still need features as well and there's some fine lines being drawn. I think it's partly a style question, it's partly how you do your work. Um, it's worth looking into if you care about that sort of stuff um, but this allows us as developers to work better and more consistently and use uh, modern tools like our, our Git um, version control more effectively. So there's a ton of value in that for us and there's a, there's a ton uh, to be explored and discovered. Um, you know, just how to work better and more consistently for us. Also for developers, everything is entities and everything is fields now. Um, it's not that, you know, nodes are a special citizen and users are another completely uh, separate, unique kind of flower and ne'er the twain shall meet. Um, every entity is also fieldable. Um, so I can, um, you know, if I really want to, I can put comments on comments now and, um, um, you know, in Drupal 7 you could only comment on nodes. Now uh, we've got a, a lot more pow uh, power to this and um, so I can build, I can model essentially now any sort of data that I want from the real world inside of Drupal and, and then I have this wonderfully structured data that we can then process. So because I, ev I can put everything in a field and ev fields are then semantically meaningful in displays and to views, um, right? We understand what content management is. It's just semantic data, very granular, very well organized. Um, so this is superb. And hey presto, by the way, did you know that blocks are reusable in Drupal 8? That is pretty super cool. And not only are they reusable, we now have block types which are just like content types for content, but I can define a block type um, and then make multiple instances of that and use them wherever I need to on my site. So block types, super interesting abstraction of, of this class of object and I think we're coming much, much closer to, to um, what blocks should have always been in our system. We've got some really powerful semantic field types that we can put on our content anywhere we want. Uh, email, uh, entity, uh, so entity reference is interesting because we can refer to any other kind of entity along the way and build these sort of uh, interesting networks, uh, uh, relationships, uh, uh, content relationships, so date, what, what have you. Um, these are very valuable. The fact that we have semantic field types um, are really, really valuable. If you're using iOS 6, is that iOS 6? Um, or any other mobile operating system, um, an email address knows it's an email address and it'll do email address validation on it along the way for free. Um, if you're putting in a phone number, it knows to put up the native number picker, same for dates, a native date picker. So having semantic field information in Drupal 8 gives us better user experiences also for free. So there's a huge amount of value in that. 
Drupal's been really, really good at SEO for a long time. Um, you know, nice HTML output and so on. Uh, all the data in drupal.org, um, it incorporates a semantic in information based on schema.org schema. Um, so these are uh, a set of literally thousands, I believe at this point, of different uh, ways to describe data. So for example, um, if I was in Munich when I made this slide, you know, I look for restaurants near me. Um, Google doesn't have an army of, of tens of thousands of people in some country typing in all of this information about this restaurant and all the other restaurants in Munich. It is scraping that data from websites that are built well with semantic data. So it gives it a price class, it knows its opening hours, it has its phone number and so on and so forth. Google just takes this from what we build and you can tell your customers if they choose to build with Drupal, okay, we have this semantic data built in and in this sort of thing, when, when, we're, when your website is becoming less important, when it has to appear in, the, in these listings, when you know, we have these content summaries, when we have review sites, we have to make our data as available and as under, easily understandable as possible along the way, and we get that for free. We get that when we use Drupal 8 because we are subscribing to these schema.org schema. Um, schema.org is really, really interesting to page through and read the different schemas and all the different, um, you know, all the different information uh, points that you can use to describe a restaurant or a horse stable or a, you know, a factory or, I mean, it's, it's pretty fascinating, um, all the stuff that's in there. If you want to geek out on that stuff, um, worth your time. Pretty much the last point for today and I'm pleased we're doing relatively well on time. Um, April 20th, Drupal 8.1.x came out six months after Drupal 8.0.x. And this is not per se a new technical feature of Drupal, but it is a real um, advance in how we do our work. Um, the last major technical feature that went into Drupal 7, the last significant feature that was added to Drupal 7 core happened before Drupal 7 was released, essentially. So if you had a great idea for what should be in Drupal core the day after 7 released, um, you might have had to wait until now to see it in Drupal core or you probably have given up by now. Um, so we have a mechanism. So, so uh, uh, this, is, uh, this explanation is a little bit circular. So, um, we have a system now where a major release happens whenever we decide, and I'll get to how that decision point happens. We have every six months what's called a minor release, and a minor release can include significant new non-API breaking functionality. So we have a mechanism that lets us innovate every six months, and if you have a great idea now, you could see it in core, you know, a year from now, 18 months from now, six months from now, if you're really amazing, Okay, so this is, a retention, uh, this is a retention model to keep our developers happy because we can make it better all the time. And this keeps our project relevant for much longer because we can innovate within a major version. We can keep Drupal 8 relevant as long as we can keep adding functionality to it that we need for the next, for the next Internet of Things innovations, whatever's coming down the pipe. We have a uh, 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 release architecture also our code, I would say, but we have a release architecture that allows us to be extensible, and so it allows us to be, have predictable innovation. This is very important when you're selling to people. You can say, you know, Drupal is on top of this, and now that we've made a minor point release and added new features to Drupal in it, we're showing that we actually are going to keep our promise about keeping innovating with Drupal 8. Um, so you can read more about that there. What happened in Drupal 8.1.x? Well, a lot of things happened in Drupal 8.1.x. It is, uh, you can read about it there. There were more than 500 contributors who worked less than six months to get the new release out. We have Big Pipe added and the migration uh, suite of modules added as experimental modules. Um, migration needs a lot of work if you know anybody who wants to help with that, especially the Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 migration path is not ready but it needs testing now, so that's why it's in core. Um, CK Editor got two new buttons. Uh, automated JavaScript testing will now be possible. This is, uh, this is really, really exciting for the, for the QA fans in the room. Um, 
and we have a new help page that's more flexible and it displays the core tours. Who knew about, who, who had forgotten about tours in Drupal 8? Tours are a really, really neat feature that allows us to build help systems into our websites. Go check it out. Um, I think it was, a, it was a darling of everyone's sort of, it was top of mind right at the beginning of the re uh, release cycle and then it hasn't gotten any attention in a long time. It's very, very cool. Um, and a ton of other things happen, but so Drupal 8 uh, didn't have these things and now it does. Um, and here's a model of what this semantic versioning looks like. Um, it doesn't mean that after 8.123 that Drupal 9 is going to happen. Um, this is trying to show that essentially as long as Drupal 8 is out, Drupal 7 will be security supported. Um, we're, we're still going to support two major versions in the community. But here, every six months, we can add significant features. We can update what our system does in these minor point releases. And we will do them as long as we want, as long as we need, until a change happens that needs an API break. And when we have to break an API, um, this is the promise we've made. We'll see how it happens in practice, right? But when we, when we break an API, um, that's when Drupal uh, 2 continue to innovate in a way that we agree is important. That's when we cut Drupal 9 and start working on Drupal 9. Now, there's an interesting consequence of this, um, and one of my uh, one thing that I personally really like, we have wonderful, incredibly smart colleagues who've been working on Drupal Core for any number of years and have never worked on a live, living, breathing, in production major version of Drupal. They have always, like the day after Drupal 6 came out, Drupal 7, you know, the Drupal 7 tag was cut and there are people who've never worked on a system that was in production and they, you know, and I mean this with all respect, but we would get Drupal 5 and 6 and 7 thrown over the wall and everybody would go work on the cutting edge of the next thing. But now our friends and colleagues who do all that smart work, all the stuff that I'm absolutely will never be capable of doing, they have to work with us. They have, they have to work in here and we're all making, we, we can give them feedback that they can, right, within six months, within a year, react to and make our Drupal better now before they're allowed to go and play in the theoretical Drupal 9 and 10 land. Um, I mean, people are developing at least mentally features for the next two versions of Drupal already, but right now, all of our innovation is in our living, breathing release, and that's really, 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 really powerful. Uh, two last things that I find really, really interesting, and these, these, are, these are just a vision of what could happen. Um, typo 3 CMS 7 is unfortunately kind of great, um, and we're really lucky that adoption of Typo 3 outside of Germany and German-speaking Europe is very, very poor. Um, they've done an amazing amount of work in the last few years. They have 200 core developers contributed to their release. We have 3,300. I mean, it's a much smaller community, but their product is unfortunately really good. They have really super easy upgrades. It's like a button click, go between the thing, take 20 minutes, you're good. Like they've managed to solve a lot of the problems that we've never been good at. And we've built a ton of risk into our lives by making our versions um, really, really, like the upgrades are a lot of work. They're very expensive and we know this is a problem. We don't like to talk about it out loud. We should never admit it to our clients in these terms, but it's there. Um, these, these minor upgrades um, are supposed to be very, very easy and, and painless as we go through our, uh, once we have a Drupal 8 site to keep up with this. Um, there's the possibility now, um, as we go through this, that the Drupal 9 APIs to start with are simply the Drupal 8 APIs with whatever else Drupal 9 needs on top of it. And eventually cutting out to call it Drupal 9 will simply be a matter of turning off some of the old ones and keeping the new ones so that you might have a phase where you have a Drupal 8.9 API and your uh, compatibility upgrade of your module might just making it be compatible with both ends of that so that when upgrade time comes, it's just as easy as a minor version release. Over time, right, things that don't need to change shouldn't change. So then you can have the same thing happening when a 9.10, 9.10 double API and easy upgrades. And if we can remove this inflection point, the risk of non-upgrade or changing to other platforms, we would have a ton of benefit out of that as service providers. If we can provide uninterrupted, cheap upgrade paths, huge. Semantic versioning gives us that chance. Standardized code 
universal systems internally, all the stuff that we've gotten with Drupal 8 gives us that chance. I'm really excited. I'm absolutely convinced that Drupal 8 is the right technology for us at the right time. I'm convinced that we haven't missed the boat, and I really, really think that we're on the cusp of remaining great and growing a lot for the next five, ten years, or what have you. Thank you all for coming. Um, really, really happy to be at Drupal again, DrupalCon again. I'm pretty easy to find online. I will be here all week. Um, if you want to hang out, have a beer or whatever. And we could even have a couple questions right now if you're not all exhausted by listening to me for the last hour. <laughs> Just have to turn that on. Hello. I'm not in any way a developer. I'm the other end of this, but okay. I really enjoyed your presentation. So Drupal 8 seems, as we all know, dramatically different from Drupal 7. So as an owner of a, of a good working Drupal 7 site, it seems like a big deal to change to Drupal 8. So why would I, what, what, should I really do that or should I even really think about it? It seems no. very expensive and very hard. Yeah. Um, so over, for, there's a multifaceted answer, and it's a, it's a very, very good question. If your Drupal 7 website does everything that you need it to do, um, there's no reason for you to upgrade just because. The moment Drupal, so innovation in our community is shifting to the Drupal 8 release. The moment you can't make your Drupal 7 thing do what you need, and Drupal 8 does it, is when you need to consider the upgrade. Um, over time, our migration paths will be really solid. There'll be a lot more contributed modules available, and the upgrade itself will be cheaper and easier. And we've changed it from an upgrade path to a migration path to do that also in the future. So hang in there. No pressure at all. 